to get started here. Um, so thanks for um, joining the session about building AI systems with Metaflow. Uh, my name is Ville Tulas. I'm a CEO, co-founder at Outer Bounds. I used to be at Netflix before, like where we started Metaflow, which is an open source project that has been around for a good number of years now, used by many, many companies. So as, as um, like some quick housekeeping items, um, I will post a few links on the chat. Sorry, I mean, like the, the links don't look too great, but I mean, let's see. I think like you can hopefully figure it out. It's pretty like I wanted to point out that we do have a very active um, Slack community. So like, yeah, it like removes the HTTP. So that should be in the front. So you can join that. So if you don't have patience to follow um, this presentation, I mean, please join that. And also like we have a lot of fun content uh, online. So you can, you can check it out. So um, today's talk is really like much about the uh, uh, open source Metaflow and how you can use it to build actual real life AI systems. Now, the topic of this summit uh, is, is on the one hand, it is uh, Gen AI. So as some of you may know, Metaflow has been around like for, for like a while, many, many companies use it for traditional ML use cases. And we actually love traditional ML use cases. So it's not only limited to Gen AI and LLMs and, and so forth. But I mean, given the topic of this event, um, like definitely I'll be focusing a bit more uh, like on the on the Gen AI stuff. Um, although kind of I guess like a touching the whole workflow that applies to other use cases as well. So and uh, as as always, like please do post questions on the on the chat. Like if you have any, hopefully we have time in the end to get get your questions. And uh, okay, so without without further ado, like what I wanted to do here in the beginning is to actually like give you a bit of a motivation. Now, uh, for those of you who are mainly interested in um, <clears throat> getting like hands-on stuff, especially like on the open source side, uh, like stay tuned, like we will actually like get to that like kind of in, in about 10 minutes. So I just wanted to motivate this for the, <clears throat> for those of uh, you like who might not know like kind of a, what Metaflow is, is all about. And, and the context here is that, um, it, it is a fact that there are like a, so many exciting things that like you are able to do with the new Gen AI models. And I, I think like one thing that people kind of do a bit underestimate that like we are in the very early days. And although it may feel that the field is developing extremely fast, it is a good like kind of a thing to keep in mind that uh, in some sense, like things move fast in some other sense and um, things actually like do take time. And I always like to use this um, e-commerce example uh, here. So this is actually like what you see here in, on the screen is an e-commerce store like a 2014 era. So that's like pretty much exactly a 10 years ago. And, and you can see that this is a very traditional like e-commerce layout. So you have a, like a different materials, like you have different colors, you have different price ranges overall, like you have different filters that you can use to see a subsets of products that these, these guys had available at their, and in, the, in their web store. And, and like you can imagine like how a system like this works behind the scenes. So like you choose something like that. Okay, I want the material to be cotton. I want the price range to be less than uh, $2,000. I want the color to be red and so forth. And then the JavaScript sends the, these filters to the backend side and the backend like would map them like pretty much exactly to a SQL query. And then you execute that SQL statement that select all the whatever pieces of furniture like where the price is less than $2,000, the color equals red and so forth. And then um, you return the, the results, the products, um, like to the user. And like the nice thing is that, of course, thanks to the World Wide Web, and this is a big difference to how things used to be, let's say, in 1980s or 1990s, is that now like we can we can show these images. And now, like if you fast forward this to um, 2023, so about 10 years here, so you can see that there are some some similarities, uh, some differences. So obviously, like one. Um, similarity here is that uh like you can still see the filters the filters have kind of moved from the left hand side to the top but i mean it's basically exactly the same thing like you can choose the price and you can choose the color you can choose the material and so forth and and like besides the fact that like probably that they have like done 15 different refactorings like as the javascript frameworks evolve uh, like probably the backend is pretty much the same that um, you just take the filters, you execute the SQL query against your database and you get the results. Now, one obvious difference that you can see here is that the images are bigger. And this is of course like one of the uh, great advancements that we have had you know, on the technological front that we have more bandwidth available so we can just make the images bigger. And now an interesting question here is that like if you extrapolate 
that how will the world look like in in let's say in a few years time i think like honestly like 2026 might be a bit optimistic here but i mean let's say that um <clears throat> we will start seeing experiences like this in, in a few years time and now well i mean it's not hard to see that um that uh, like if the trend line continues and like we have more bandwidth available to kind of make the images bigger, eventually like we will get to the point that like it is like a one one big image, so that's 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 fun. But I mean that's that's more like a like an incremental improvement rather than any kind of a big paradigm shift. Now like what is a true paradigm shift that like really is of course the very much at the at the core of this conference as well, is this thing that like now we have a a whole new user interface paradigm for interfacing with any kind of computing system. And that interface is, of course, natural language that we have available thanks to large language models. So for instance, like in this case, instead of like doing the point and click that the material e equals cotton and, uh, and the color equals red, or like the color equals pink, now like we have an option like basically for the first time ever like which is a big deal to use natural language which is which is the most human way of, of communicating with the system to say that well actually like this is not what i had in mind could i have a pink sofa and now you can imagine that not only like you can um, um, communicate like with the machine like using uh, using natural language but thanks to other advancements in generative AI, we are also able to generate these very realistic images on the fly, which used to be nearly impossible hard in the past. And of course, there's minor issues here, like maybe actually the, the table wouldn't have uh, five legs and, and, and so forth. But many of these issues will get fixed. And now I guess like when it comes to a, a real life system here, and the exciting part here is really to kind of consider that what are the actual product experiences and the service experiences that we will be building in a couple of years time not not only like a fancy tech demos so in the in the actual experience for instance it could be so that um like the the user submits a photo of their living room like maybe this is the living room and then like you can overlay on the fly the furniture in the living room i i'm, I'm sure that like experiences like this are already available to a degree and i'm, I'm sure that they will be only only getting better and, and like then you can interface with the system like as if you were in an actual uh, furniture showroom. You could say that, no, 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 actually, it's not the pink sofa. I want the leather sofa instead. And like, then you can just like overlay the same, same thing there. And or like maybe if this is uh, your actual living room, like you could point at some item there. So like we have this like artisan bamboo lamp and, uh, and like you, you get the information about this item. And uh, and like of course even like at that like a pointing action like that you can point at the part of the image and like you can like kind of understand like what you are referring to I mean that's actually like a non-trivial computer vision problem or at least used to be so before the the latest models like this is actually using the segment anything model from Meta. Now. For the purposes of this conference, I, I think that the title is something along the lines of uh, uh, AI tools and, and open source tools for, for Gen AI. Of course, the interesting question is that how are we going to build experiences like this in a few years' time? So maybe it will be one of you here, like building building these uh, e-commerce experiences, or maybe building like whatever is the product or, or service that you are focusing on. Now, like the rest of the presentation, like we will really like a dive into details, like how we may actually like make that happen. Now at the high level, a couple of things that we want to recognize that, okay, so what are the things that we actually need to build? Well, the first thing is that like we, kind of need to implement this uh, natural language interface to the system. And now one thing that um, I, I want to highlight here is that the idea is not necessarily like just to interface with ChatGPT and have a usual like a chatbot experience. But I, I bet that what becomes increasingly important that as, as these chatbots and as the LLMs become increasingly mainstream, and I, I think that this is like really already happening, is it like kind of just the fact that you can kind of like quote unquote talk to a computer? I mean, that's actually like a loses loses kind of the, the, the kind of the, the novel value rather quickly. And then like people really, really start focusing on the quality. So here you don't want to have a generic chatbot like talking about the, the, the meaning of life and, and the politics and so forth, but you want to have the best possible a furniture salesperson, basically who has the most domain knowledge about the couches, about the furniture that you want to buy. And the question is that like, how do we develop those things? Now, as I mentioned, the other thing here might be that, okay, I mean, like if, if we have this visual component, like there's a question that, okay, I mean, if we overlay the images on top of your own photos, like how do we actually understand like what you're pointing at? And, and again, I mean, that's a bit of a computer vision challenge, but, but can be solved today. Now, an interesting thing also like about the description, I don't know if you had a time to take a look at that, um, 
is that uh, like that description was also generated by by a large language model. And uh, now the interesting thing here is that um, always in the past, for the past many 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 decades, it has been so that let's say that you have the furniture store. And like this company has had an engineering department and it has been the job of the engineering department to create the website and create the database on the back end side and then like stitch everything together technically. But then there have been other people, um, maybe kind of a designers, marketing people, uh, product managers, whoever, who are then responsible for actually populating the database and writing the content. But now in this case, like thanks to LLMs, like these, like even the organizational boundaries are starting to get muddied. And, and like, like, let's say it is the data science, it is the AI ML department that's responsible for these LLMs. And again, I mean, these LLMs are not just like uttering like random nonsense, but you really want to tune these LLMs to really um, kind of echo the, the, the brand and, and the nature of the company. So like kind of a, the idea is that like now that almost the data science department has to be much closer connected to the business so that they can actually like fine tune the model to be exactly reflective of, of what the company stands for. And of course, there are like a whole bunch of questions, maybe not so much in the in the context of e-commerce stores, but I mean, in other contexts, especially about the ethics and responsibility, which again, like very much like a fall into this bucket of, of like the, the kind of the technical and these like other considerations going hand in hand. Now, when it comes to other considerations of running a company, it's not only the product, but it's also things like marketing. Uh, marketing is getting getting only more sophisticated. You may want to have influencers, like maybe you have a, like a Mr. Beast or or like a somebody else like promoting your products, and you can get very smart about this as well. I mean, the competition is only only getting tougher. Also here, the images that you generate, I, again, I mean, the idea is not to have any random images, but they are exactly the products that, like, that you want to sell your, at your company. And not only that, I mean, not any random products, but of course, at the end of the day, the company is interested in optimizing their revenue, optimizing their bottom line. So you really want to kind of then like show the products that you think that this person right here is most likely to buy. And as I mentioned, I used to work at uh, Netflix leading ML and AI infrastructure. You can imagine that that Netflix recommendation system that you see when you log in and like it shows the TV shows and movies. That is, of course, the very key part of Netflix's business and making sure that that you don't churn, you don't stop using Netflix. And then hence they are highly incentivized to really, really think carefully, like what kind of things they want to be promoting. Not only thinking that, OK, I mean, what is kind of the school book kind of recommendation system, but I mean, also like how do we make it so that like it really optimizes our business goals as well. And now, like besides the kind of the user interface that we see here, uh, there are many, many back office kind of like uh, all the stuff that like runs companies like behind the scenes. Like for instance, like how do you know like what is the uh, inventory like that you need to maintain? Like kind of how do we optimize logistics like for all kinds of pieces of furniture, some small, some large, and so forth. And then like on the business side, how do we estimate the lifetime value like of these? Of these people so that like we can finally then optimize um like the, the products that we should be promoting and then again like kind of how do we make sure that our marketing dollars are not being wasted so the reason i wanted to show you this picture is really highlight the fact that if you think where the world is going in a few years time increasingly many companies are going to have a a whole set uh, of different very diverse ML and AI systems. So in this picture, like we have LLMs, we have a Gen AI models, like we have a computer vision models, we have a classical data science models, like we can have traditional, like kind of whatever logistic regression models, maybe even operations research and all kinds of things. And 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 this means that like kind of the demand like for the back end side is is kind of a uh, only, only getting bigger. So, and there's the kind of, this is the, the landscape that we were kind of facing at Netflix already way back when, when we started working on Metaflow. And now if you are maybe an AI developer, if you're a data scientist, maybe if you are leading the organization, if you look at the list of things that like you should be building, I mean, that's that maybe kind of gives you a bit of a, like a cold sweat because it's a, it's a bunch of work. And, uh, and it also like the, there's even the question that, okay, is there anything common about the LLMs and the inventory forecast? In some sense, they are very different technical challenges, very different models, very different types of data, very different kinds of compute and so forth. Now, when we started about thinking this problem that, okay, let's say that you want to take this kind of principled approach, like for building a platform for this company that allows them to, to iterate on these different models, like how would you go about building the platform? Because again, the challenge is that these are very diverse systems. I mean, let's say if you have a feature store, I mean, you can the feature store can be perfectly fine for the inventory forecast, but I mean, it's really like you're not going to do anything for the LLM. 
in contrast, um, you can use Langchain or something for the LLM, but it's really not going to have help with the logistic optimizer. So what are the things that might be actually common across these use cases? And like we really started thinking from the, the bottom up that, OK, at least we know that all of these use cases require data. So sometimes the data is uh, structured, like in the case of inventory forecast. In some other cases, it might be unstructured, like in the case of the LLM or like the image generation and so forth. But data you need nonetheless. The other piece that you always need, and like this is something that many, many people are now realizing is becoming centrally important, is the question of compute. Again, I mean, compute comes in different shapes and sizes. There isn't like one size fix all approach. I think that the days of Hadoop and, and maybe even Spark and like so forth, any kind of single paradigm that can solve all the problems, those are gone. Those days are gone. And now, like for the inventory forecast, like maybe you just want a bunch of CPUs, like maybe a big multi core machine. Maybe you do it with HDBoost. In other cases, you need a big fleet of, of, of GPUs. And of course, the, these hardware accelerators also like uh, like getting very diverse and like choosing the, the most cost effective approach is important. Now, another realization is that each one of these boxes is a rather elaborate system of its own. And also these systems are interconnected. So somehow you have to have that kind of the underlying fabric that connects everything together so that like you can orchestrate these systems. Maybe the LTV estimate feeds into the personalized discovery. And like maybe the logistics optim optimizer actually like affects the marketing campaigns and, and so forth. So you have to orchestrate everything. And also like what is absolutely obvious here is that you are not going to get any of these systems right from the get-go. So it is going to be inevitably an iterative process. Like there has to be a way to do continuous improvement. There has to be a way how you can experiment with new ideas. Like maybe you ship an MVP, maybe you ship the simplest possible. LTV estimate, maybe you ship some like off the shelf LLM at first, and then you think that, okay, we will fine tune it later. And you need to be able to keep track of all the progress. The same thing applies for deployment that um, like, I, I, be, I believe that even in this conference, there have been talks about, okay, so how do we do inference for LLMs at scale, which is a non-trivial problem. But that's also a very different kind of a problem than let's say, how do we, uh, like do deployment for the causal marketing model. I mean, maybe the causal marketing model just like runs once per night and then calls the meta Google APIs and then balances the budgets. I mean, it's a very, very different type of deployment. So there again, I mean, there isn't the one size fits all. And also the, the, of course, like at the top of the stack, the question is that uh, like, what are the models? Now for the LLMs, um, maybe you are using deep speed to, uh, to, to kind of fine tune the model, like maybe for a logistics optimizer, maybe that is a, like kind of a whatever, uh, like um, um, kind of an operations research package that you are using there. And like maybe for marketing model, you use psychic learn, like many, many different options there. The, the, the landscape is only getting more diverse. And it's pretty, when it comes to Gen AI and LLM, it's pretty obvious that like the, the packages that we use today, I mean, they will be evolving fast. In some cases, they might even get replaced with, with some other approaches like over the coming years. So you want to have flexibility at the top of the stack. Now, right, really the motivation like for like what we are doing with, with Metaflow, what we are doing at Outer Bounds is this idea that the, the AI and ML systems that you will be building, they, they will also need a lot of code and orchestration and not just models. The models are important. There has been a lot of attention on the models. And like, like now we have a Llama 3, like when I'm sure that like we will have a Llama 4, we will have a Llama 5 and like a zillion other models. And that's awesome. But also that is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Like what actually like makes it sufficient is that you need to have like all the infrastructure. You need to have all that like a code components that then like actually make these actual systems happen so that you are kind of going beyond the demos, right? It's like a fun fun example of like a dancing corgis and pandas that you can find in our blog. You can you can check it out. Now, what we have been doing with Metaflow um, since the early days, first at Netflix and then in open source is that like we we have taken this full stack approach that like we believe that like when it comes to building these actual systems it is very useful to kind of consider all the moving pieces that you need like all the way starting from data like to compute to orchestration versioning and so forth and also like there's this um realization that building systems like this uh requires kind of a careful balance between the engineering concerns and like as many of you have experienced um just like getting access to data, just getting access to scalable compute. There are like many, many engineering questions that are related, including, of course, like the cost optimization and how do we get GPUs in a cost efficient manner. Then on the other hand, like 
when like if you were the person the purple hat person the data scientist the ai developer the ml developer who's responsible now for like building this most amazing let's say the llm so the most amazing most cost like whatever um uh, impactful like a lifetime estimate models you need a lot of freedom to be able to test different modeling approaches like kind of a think about like carefully that okay so how do we kind of run these models operationally like how do we deploy them to production and of course like keeping track of all the experiments so forth so there is this kind of like yin and yang type of situation with these two triangles that okay we have to balance the engineering concerns to kind of all those all those like operational concerns that come to uh that that, that come with production systems with then um uh, like the kind of the need to be able to experiment freely like on the on the kind of the uh the uh the science side and this is again like kind of the philosophy that like we have tried to support like with metaflow for many many years and now uh for those of you who are not familiar with metaflow already um indeed it was studied at netflix but now ever since then there have been many many other companies across industries who have started using it like who find it quite useful like many many financial services companies like many life sciences companies many logistics companies and so forth so definitely check it out so if you haven't seen metaflow before i can actually like put the link here just for your convenience as well actually like maybe the easiest thing for you is to go to the metaflow documentation docs.metaflow.org so that is of course like all open source you can start using it today you don't have to call us now like of course the kind of a official like a pitch about our company outer bounds so what we do is that like if you want to get the platform that allows you to build these systems easily like in your own account uh without having to worry too much about the engineering concerns i mean that's what we provide as a managed service and i will actually like to show you next kind of what it means in practice because maybe at this point Many of you might be interested that okay, show show me the code, like show me how it actually works. Um, so I, I don't want to kind of spend too much time, like I'm just going over the basics of Metaflow because and I'm sure that like all of you, you can head to the documentation. Um, uh, suffice to say that uh, Metaflow is a Python library, pip install Metaflow, um, that gives you basically a unified, really easy to use, very developer friendly interface to all parts of the stack. So it all starts with the data. For instance, um, if you need to load data quickly, like I can show you an example, let's say from Snowflake, from Databricks, whatever your data lake, data warehouse might be, you can do that. But also then so that when you have a workflow, like what you can see here, you have a hello flow, two step, start step, end step. And then like you have to kind of move data like throughout the workflow, uh, Metaflow makes it very easy. So for instance here, like when you do self.x, um, like Metaflow persists that automatically. And when you, let's say do plus equals here. So of course, like we have to download now like the previous value and then increment that. And all, all these like a data flow questions happen behind the scenes. Now, the other important part here, and like actually, like I can show you a bit more about this because this is becoming centrally important now, is the question of compute. So, um, Metaflow and um, the, the kind of one of the key features of Metaflow is really easy access to compute. So, maybe may, may, maybe many of you may, may look at this and say that, okay, I mean, there are so many workflow orchestrators, and how is this different than Airflow, or how is this different than Daxter, or, or like a prefect, or like kind of a many, many other options? Well, and like then the easy kind of a differentiator is that, okay, like kind of how do you think about the compute and how do you get access to compute? And that's Metaflow, what Metaflow provides out of the box. I can actually like show you one slide after this about that. Now, um, like one important thing, especially like for those of you, uh, you who have used um, notebooks in the past, is that Metaflow takes this workflow concept as the first class citizen. The big thing here is that you don't have to kind of overlay the workflow on top of like everything else. It is the kind of a very much the thing that you will be building all the time. And like we make it very easy to kind of a treat that workflow, the DAG, as a, as a first kind of a class concern. Like it doesn't add much overhead to what you uh, would do in a notebook anyways, but it gives you a lot of power thinking things that way. Now I can also like show you a demo, like how Metaflow versions everything automatically. So every time you execute something, we keep track of that. And like in contrast to like a separate experiment trackers, like Metaflow may like tracks the full state of the workflow, not only the models, not only the arts, like some artifacts here and there, but absolutely everything that happens inside the workflow. And then when it comes to deployment, like there are many, many different patterns. As I said before, there isn't like a single one size fits all that like this is the ultimate way to do like deployments. Again, like we support both real-time inference, batch inference, many different patterns. Again, I mean, oftentimes integrating with your existing systems instead of saying that like you have to replace what you have already built with something new. And now when it comes to the modeling, also like one thing that's really, really important that kind of goes hand in hand with the compute is that of course, compute in isolation doesn't mean much. It only means 
something like when you can actually like execute your own code in that compute environment. And when I say own code, that must mean like the libraries that you depend on. So of course, like all uh, like a interesting ML and AI code, like depend on off the shelf libraries these days, like it'd be PyTorch, DeepSpeed, Scikit-Learn, and be, be, being able to then like uh, take control of the dependency management, which is oftentimes a bit like kind of a, uh, under appreciated uh, kind of a uh, concept like in these like production MLAI systems is very important. So there's a lot of machinery for that. Okay, so now I kind of for those of you uh, you who like want to see actual demos, uh, I will like kind of spend the rest of the time like showing like how things work in practice. And uh, I, I don't think that like we have infinite time, but hopefully like I have time to cover the basics. So, okay, so like, how do you actually like build, start building these ML and AI systems? And like, let's quickly go through the kind of whole life cycle. Starting from the fact that um, you need to um, like get access to data. And uh, and now, I mean, like you can, you can see that like here's a Snowflake logo, could be anything else. It could be your own data lake, could be Iceberg, could be Databricks, could be your database, whatever. And now let's say that you start working on one of these projects. Again, I mean, could be LLM, like it could be classical data science forecasting, like, and they're like maybe a couple of colleagues of yours, like who are working with you um, in this project. Now, like one of the really the most foundational questions, even before thinking anything else, is that, okay, how do you get access to data? And not only how do you get access to data, but in many real life environments, let's say you work at a bank, or let's say you deal with, um, like a health related data, uh, like in those cases, like think really like thinking about the data governance, thinking about compliance, thinking about security. Those are important concerns, maybe not the most exciting things, but something that like you have to take care of. Now, what I can show you actually like here, let me kind of show that part later, but um, just to kind of give you like a really quick idea is that um, like, let's say you want to get access uh, to, to your data in Snowflake. So in the case of Metaflow, um, it's really like quite straightforward. First, we integrate with your secret manager. So instead of you having to uh, kind of a hard code the secret somewhere, like kind of a, this is something that like even the most kind of a security conscious organizations like feel comfortable with that like, let's say it connects to your AWS secret manager, let's say like you're connecting to Snowflake. Now what I mentioned about dependencies, like you can like layer the dependencies on the fly. So you don't have to worry too much about like a, like a baking Docker image or anything of that sort. Like, let's say we just want to access Snowflake. And then on the, on the kind of a Snowflake side, of course, like this is their standard client, nothing too special here. The big thing is that like you get those secrets and then let's say like you can just run the SQL query you want to run on the fly and outcomes, let's say in this case, a, a pandas data frame. So like the, the kind of, of course, this like looks very straightforward by design as it should. But the key thing here is that uh, like the whole connection is very secure. Like it complies like with whatever, like a data governance policies you have on the Snowflake side, thanks to the kind of a couple of features that I can show later, like how you can set the policies on the platform side. Now, uh, let me see if I can actually like, uh, pull the, this one back here, like because the kind of exciting parts are here. So let me actually like kind of show like a few things that I want to demonstrate. So there's always the, um, uh, also like a bit like underappreciated aspect that like, how do you actually do your work? I, I can imagine that maybe many of you uh, have been using notebooks in the past, maybe in a Google Colab environment, maybe Jupyter Notebooks, maybe SageMaker Studio, many, many options out there. Maybe some of you use IDEs. Um, and like maybe you do it on your laptop, but uh, it's kind of almost surprising that still as of today in 2024, uh, these development environments are a bit all over the place. So on the one hand, if you are doing your work on your laptop, the challenge that you have is that like, well, now you and your colleagues like may have a different working environment. And what is worse is that your laptop most likely, let's say you are using Windows, maybe you are using MacBook. It's a very different environment than what you have in production with even different packages. So then like moving to production, I mean, inevitably you just have to figure out that the dependencies are different. And like, plus there might be zillion other differences between your experimentation environment and production, which is problematic. So we kind of want to address that. Then the other thing is that like, if you have, if you open your notebook, if you open SageMaker Studio, whatever, like oftentimes there's a bit of a blank slate. And then the question is that, well, actually like, how do I start architecting these applications? I mean, like somebody needs to give you some kind of a guidance that like, what is even the architecture? Like, how do we structure the whole thing? I mean, it's not like a, that you can, you can start like always with an empty slate. So like thinking about the developer friendly API is super important, which is exactly what, what Metaflow does. 
And the whole point of having this environment, including the APIs, is that you can start developing really rapidly and like actually like building something that then like moves you consistently towards the production systems. And of course, like it, notebooks are like really quite nice at like when it comes to rapid developments. But the challenge is that notebooks don't you uh, don't always lead you in any kind of linear way like towards production systems. I mean, like they are fine for experimentation, but again, I mean, there's always the uncomfortable question that okay, how do we actually build something that we can run in production? And that's really the kind of a key thing that Metaflow wanted to address and like why it got so popular first at Netflix and then at other companies that like companies and like anybody who cares about the actual value created, like you really need to think like from the day one that how do we actually like kind of get this in the hands of our users and customers as fast as possible. So now, like, just to kind of like show you um, how it works in practice, let me kind of see if I can like pull my, um, uh, let's see the kind of the browser again. So I was like showing you, I wanted to show you the actual interface. Maybe I'll do it here. So um, I will be showing this um, on the on the Outer Bounds product. As I mentioned, like kind of everything on the Metaflow side, you can go to the docs.metaflow.org. Everything here, of course, open source, like you can use all these features uh, with Outer Bounds and the Outer Bounds just provides you basically that platform that allows you to get super productive and especially like get to production in a serious environment really quickly. So for instance, like when you want to set up these workstations, I can just go in the UI, I can do add workstation, I can create one for myself, let's say, and I can pick one of these users. Of course, like all the authentication and authorization is connected to your SSO provider like Google. So for it, I could even like use on-prem resources. Some of our customers, they have a GPU boxes in their office, so you could use those resources as well. But oftentimes, like you could just like leverage cloud resources. And now what is really remarkable here is that um, in contrast to environments like Google Colab or, or like maybe GitHub workspaces, uh, these environments, they run in your cloud account. So you are not sending data to us. You are not kind of sending your compute to us, none of that. But I mean, all like runs in your cloud account could be AWS account, Azure account, GCP account, whatever runs on your side. Now, the big big benefit of using these cloud workstations is that you can make sure that everybody has a consistent environment. So you can choose a Docker image that everybody uses. And um, it doesn't have to be anything too special, like because Metaflow also allows you to kind of layer additional dependencies on top of that. And OK, so I have many of the workstations, so I'm, I'm not going to create another one. But um, now let's say like how you access this workstation is actually like through VS Code. So we have a uh, Outer Bounds extension. And now like when, once you have installed the extension and you have a, like kind of just copy pasted your configuration string there, what you can do is that like all these workstations that are available me show up here on the in this panel. So what I can then do is that I can connect to one of these workstations. And now um, for those of you uh, who have used uh, um, VS Code with remote containers in the past. Like this probably looks pretty familiar in the sense that it's just normal VS Code with the difference that uh, you can see that it's now actually connected to the cloud instance. So whatever I execute here uh, actually like executes in the cloud and not, not on my laptop. And there are a couple of benefits for this. Um, of course, the kind of uh, the, the, the consistent environment, as I mentioned, is one benefit. Also, um, kind of many companies feel um, for a good reason that it's a much more secure way of doing things because you don't have random pieces of data on your laptop in people's laptop. And especially like what, what like really delights many people is that things tend to be quite a bit faster as well as you don't have to move data and compute between like the uh, like your local laptop, maybe over your home Wi-Fi and the cloud, everything happens in the cloud. So now here, like I can, just do, uh, let's say, Python hello run. So this is very simple. You can see like a kind of 16 lines of Python, like very straightforward. And I can just execute it as any, any Python script. Like nothing nothing too special here. This is, of course, like really, really like a basic Metaflow stuff that you can do at home. Now, the nice thing is that when you execute this, like I can go to the UI. And the UI shows now like that, OK, this was the DAG that we just executed. This is the timeline. Uh, here, like on the timeline, like we can, um, or like on the task view, we can see like, of course, like all the logs and also like we can customize this view to show like whatever information, even custom visualizations, I can show how that works as well. So I can keep track of everything, not only what I do, but like also like everything that my colleagues are doing on the system. So if I only like want to see like what I'm doing, I could limit it to my user uh, and like see all the my past executions or like I could look at like what somebody else is doing, doing on the system like Eddie here so that we get that experiment tracking out of the box. 
Now, um, well, maybe I'll kind of just like show you for, for fun uh, this uh, example, like where you can have custom visualizations. So let's say we have this like a fun example that has this feature called uh, Metaflow card. What we can do is that let's like run this photos example here. And uh, you can actually like maybe see here that like we are fetching some photos and then uh, like we are for like a, we are fetching five photos like once once per second and then like a showing them on a card. So how this works in practice is that like I go back to the UI here. Now I can load the start step like the same same stuff. If there was any output, it would show up here. But now we have this section here called called card and you can customize uh, this view to show whatever information you want so in this case we are just like showing the photos but you could have custom charts like you would show how your training run converges or like if you had a computer vision application like you can really see how things are working and so forth so besides having the usual log files and progress bars and stuff like that it's very very handy that you can basically have that almost like kind of a like a mini dashboard that like is attached basically to every function that you run. So, I mean, of course, like there are many ways to create dashboards, but it's super convenient that anytime you run a function, you can kind of get that visual output on the fly. That's, that's really, really fun. Now, uh, quickly going back, let's see if I can pull you that um, slide here. Let me do a quick time check. So I think we have a few minutes here. So a couple of things that I really want to demonstrate. Uh, we quickly uh, touch the question of tracking everything. I can like talk more about that and then like a compute. So now uh, here, like, let me show you this example. When we do uh, self.x in Metaflow and uh, here, like we printed out the value, I guess maybe in case you didn't see, we can totally guess what's going to happen here. So we are basically assigning the self.x123 here and then like we are printing it out here in the end step. So like very, very straightforward. Here, one, two, three. Now the, the the cool thing here is that every time you execute something like this uh, experiment, the execution gets an ID two six two one. And now we can go in a notebook and like let's say here in the notebook I can do hello flow, and I can ask like what was the latest execution of this, and it is this two six two one, the same guy as here. But not only that, I can like then like peek in and ask what was the value of x, and the value of x is is one two three. Now you can imagine that like we could change this value, we can run it again. And thanks to the fact that every time you execute something, Metaflow actually snapshots all those values and stores them in your S3 bucket. Uh, so you can always then go back in time. And like now, of course, like we can ask, okay, like what is now the latest run? Latest run is now 2622. We can ask that, okay, what is the value of X now? Like it is, it is 456. And not only that, but like we keep that history forever. So you can see all the past executions of this, uh, of this uh, flow. And now you could like kind of go back in time. And let's say like, I want to go back in time. Let's see this guy. Uh, like, I think maybe this was like a, uh, like one of the, well, actually like kind of, the one that I just did. So it used to be one, two, three, and now like then it changed to, uh, well, let's see, I guess maybe, yes, then it changed to four or five, six. And now you can imagine that this could be a model, this could be a data frame, this could be a metric, and you can then like keep track of all these things over time. And you can, in a notebook, you can analyze the data. You are not limited to any predefined dashboard. You can do whatever you want in a notebook or any other kind of Python environment. This is straightforward Python API. Okay, so that's all good and fine. So everything gets tracked automatically. Every all the experiments get, get tracked. Now, the the really the important part is that okay, so it's not only about workflow orchestration, but it's also about compute. And in this case, let's say I'll just like show you quickly because I know that we don't have infinite time. Uh, that uh, in this case, like instead of running it locally, I can say that okay, I want to run this with Kubernetes. In this case, we want to train a bunch of models in parallel. So we have a list of of three countries, USA, Brazil, and Italy. And then we say that, okay, now we want for each, we want kind of the mapping operation like over the list. So, and like we want to train a model. So in this case, we say that in order to train the model, we need two CPU cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM. And just by doing that with Kubernetes, and actually like I have the Kubernetes here, so it's even like a bit redundant in this case. Now, like we are going to the cloud and we are taking this function and executing it in the cloud with the cloud resources. So I can um, go back to the UI here. Like if we go to the scalable flow, now you can see that we have these training stop steps that like are super fast in this case, and they are executing in parallel. In the back view, you can see that like all these things are happening in parallel. And what I wanted to show you really quick here is that uh, what happens behind the scenes that as we are executing these things, we are actually like going now to the cloud account 
and scaling the cluster to make sure that you have the resources that you need. So actually, like in this chart, like you can see like the cluster demand. So like there was a big spike before. And like when that spike happened, like we actually went in and like we launched a bunch of new instances. So we had like kind of four instances, M5, 4X largest at some point, and then we scale it back to two. And like you can have any mixture of different uh, compute nodes, including GPU nodes here. So you can get access to any amount of compute power in your account, which is which is like, of course, absolutely a key when you are building these AI applications. Again, I mean, this applies to hyperparameter searches, like where you could have a thousand tasks running in parallel, like, like training a thousand different models with different parameterizations, or it could be even uh, distributed training over a GPU cluster. All those use cases are supported. So you can actually like go to the uh, Metaflow blog. So there's this new section that we recently updated about the computing at scale, outlining all the different patterns that we support for compute, um, like from the, the horizontal scalability and vertical scalability to also these distributed training use cases. So especially like those of you, and like given that this is a Gen AI conference, like who want to kind of, let's say, use frameworks like Torch or DeepSpeed or even Ray to, um, to, to fine tune uh, your models, like maybe over a bunch of GPUs, um, like now that's supported out of the box uh, in Metaflow. I know that like we are pretty much out of time here. So let me just like show you one more thing, which is really important. So let's say like now we are happy with the results, we are able to run things at scale, and now we are ready to run things in production. In the case of Metaflow, it really couldn't be simpler. Like what I can do here is that I can say, uh, Argo Workflows create. And some of you may know that Argo Workflows is a, a very production um, grade um, Kubernetes native workflow orchestrator that is part of the platform. And now I can just say Argo Workflows create. And it is the very same code that I just wrote here. And now we basically take it and we deploy it to run automatically uh, in production. Now the question is that, okay, so how does it run automatically? Um, there are a couple of different ways. It could be based on the time or it could be based on um, some kind of event happening. And this is a super important feature that for instance, I can have, if I go here in this view, I can connect those flows to any kind of events that like happen, like maybe in the outside world, like in this case, like it is whenever like a table updates in Snowflake database, or like maybe whenever like another flow completes, I can uh, connect my flow to that uh, event so that it runs automatically. All I have to do is that I just say that, okay, this, if this flow gets triggered like whenever like data gets updated. And there here in the deployments view, then I can see like all the past executions that happen. And this way I can start building increasingly advanced systems like where let's say one piece of code uh, performs ETL, getting data from Snowflake, kind of doing whatever processing feature transformations you want, then that in turn like triggers another training flow that maybe uses a fleet of GPUs to train a model, which then in turn like let's say runs batch inference or like then maybe you deploy it to some kind of real-time inference platform. And, and like of course like you can keep eye on everything, including production, including experimentation, experimentation in the CUI. And maybe the last thing that I can just want to show you, um, kind of a, to show you like a, some like a bit more advanced examples is that for instance, in this case, we took the Geneformer model that actually applies a transformer model to, to RNA data. And in this case, we fine tune the model like for different uh, organs of the body. Let's see which, which one is this. So here, uh, for instance, um, well, I can come back to that. But for instance, like here, we are like fine tuning the model for brain cells specifically, including some custom visualizations and also keeping an eye on the GPU utilization over time. So you can do all these things as a part of that workflow, as a part of the production system. So there are a bunch of other features that like definitely should be highlighted, but I, I know that like we are pretty much at the time here. So um, I think like we pretty much like covered everything. I could just like maybe quickly go through the kind of the remaining slides here to show uh, what's there in the store. So we talked about the deploying the production and uh, and like we talked about the triggering quickly and how you can connect even these different projects. And uh, and then like one thing that uh, maybe we have to leave for the next time is that like, let's say you want to do A-B experimentation, you can even have different variants running side by side. So um, thank you for your attention today. Um, there's a lot of fun content in our blog, so you can go to the outerbounds.com slash blog. There's a really fun um, uh, test environment for Metaflow um, on the website, so you don't have to install anything locally. You can just like try the sandbox, sandbox environment, go there. 
And, uh, and then like we have a very active um, Slack community with thousands of people from various companies. So definitely check that out, um, join that, ask any questions there, like you will find me there as well. So um, if you have any questions now, please like post them on the chat, but otherwise, I mean, we can continue continue chatting on, on, on Slack. Thank you. I think like since we are already over time and I don't see any questions, I'll kind of end the live stream here, but I mean, definitely come to Slack and, uh, and like ping me there if anything comes to your mind. Oh, okay, I guess there's a question. Is there a, ver uh, is there a vision for Metaflow to have a local version as well? Um, yeah, no, I, actually like good question. So I can like just like quickly show you here that uh, definitely the, the easiest way to get started is that you can just go and like do pip install Metaflow and that thing, it runs on your laptop, it runs in any environment. It is it is really local. You don't need to have any cloud backend. Um, so you can actually like a test, you can start developing the workflows like without anything special. So um, in that sense, I guess that's as local as it gets. Does that make sense? Um, terms of scheduling the work for your own GPU. Oh yeah, like on-prem, I see, yes, yes, indeed. So um, actually like, let me show you this thing here. So um, Metaflow integrates uh, with number of different um, infrastructure environments. So you can run it of course, like on different clouds, like AWS, GCP and Azure, but also like it has the native integration to Kubernetes. So you can actually like kind of a deploy, um, well, this goes to kind of the AWS, but like we have examples, like if you had any kind of, let's say Kubernetes environment locally, we have many users who have their local, like a data center and like a local Kubernetes cluster, and you can totally use Metaflow in that environment as well. So yeah, I mean, you can, you can use it in your own data center, no need to use the cloud. Cool. Well, anyway, so we are way over time, so please, Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so yes, yeah, so please, please like join the Slack um, and uh, yeah, happy happy to kind of like keep keep like helping you there. I mean, like check out Metaflow documentation and uh, yeah, hopefully you will find it useful. Awesome. Thanks a lot. See you.